Morning, church family. How are you guys doing? Happy New Year. Happy 2019. Happy almost 2020 in 360 some days. Yeah, 2020. I thought we'd be on spaceships going across the universe. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here today. We always take the first Sabbath of the New Year to celebrate what God is doing in our church community. Um, my mom. Uh, attends a church where they are fundraising for a new building, and it's a Calvary Chapel church, and I ask her from time to time, how's the fundraising going? Do they have property? And she always says, I, I don't know anything. They don't tell the church congregation anything, and we don't want that to be the scenario here. We want people to know what's happening in our church because the best way to lead a uh, a congregation is to, to let the congregation lead with the leadership. And so we are blessed with that process happening here. So we're going to go through a year of review, and it's a lot of celebration uh, that we're going to have together here in this presentation. I wanted to uh, start off with a question, and uh, this is the question, why is Cloverdale growing? Well, is it growing? Maybe it's not growing. Maybe we just think it's growing. How do you know it's growing if you don't count, right? And the question that we're going to look at is, why? Why is Cloverdale growing? We're going to look at one particular aspect of it. Why, what are we doing that is actually creating the growth in this church? And it's not a silver bullet, but I don't think a church can grow without it. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, Second Kings, I just want to briefly look at this situation, it's a, a battle like, un, like nothing you've ever heard in your entire life. And if you don't know what happens in it, I you know, encourage you to read Second Kings chapter 6. Elisha is there. He's in a city with an army surrounding it that's come to kill him, get rid of him. And in the midst of that, Elisha has a servant that's scared to death. And in verse 17 of chapter 6, it says, Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may, what? See. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. Seesaw. <laughs> And his servant said to him, alas, my man. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Verse, I jumped back two verses. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, how did they get there? And how did Elisha know they were there? This angel army that was surrounding him. And how engaged are angels in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis? It's a very important question, and it ties into why we're growing as a church. Um, I'm thankful for we're here today. I'm thankful the angels are here today as well. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so much more engaged with our lives in this world than we ever even can imagine. May you bless us as we look back on what you've done through this year, and thank you that we could be together to, to review in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at church attendance. Uh, back in 1976, there were six people. Uh, here's a picture of them. You've got Terry Mace, the top left, and next to him is brother Perry Mace. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the wrong picture. This is just a picture of the Heritage Singers. Yeah. All right. Let's go to attendance. Average attendance over the last nine years. Um... I don't even think the Macy's, are the Macy's here? <laughs> Terry and Perry are not here, are they? Oh, you'll have to tell them. Actually, I want to do a special music sometime. If you go on YouTube from the old heritage singers, you can, let me back up. You can see these two cats up there swaying around, <laughs> singing and smiling. <laughs> so I wanted to surprise them with a special music sometime that they don't know about. Would they be mad at that? If I did that, would they hate me? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, let's <laughs> average attendance. So here's the kind of the trends we've seen over the last nine years. Uh, here's the numbers. In 2010, we averaged 199. 
Um, as you see, we've steadily increased those numbers. Uh, last year, we went up to 388. That's the average attendance here at Cloverdale. We're almost hitting 400. It's such a great uh, progress to see. And these aren't just numbers. These are stories of people's lives. This is your life. This is my life. Um, I love being a part of this community. I really do. There's been times when I wish I wasn't a pastor in the sense of the challenges of a, of a congregation, but we love being here. We, we really do, and it's because of you. And if you weren't here, I wouldn't want to be here, um, even though Boise is an amazing place to live, by the way. Um, so 388 is our average. We wanted to see how low it dips over the years, so we looked at a, a metrics of 275 in attendance, and in 2011, 93% of our services were under that number. Uh, we didn't hit any Sabbaths that were under 275 this year. So that's a really healthy. Now we have a new met metrics of 400 in attendance. So you can see over the last five years, that number's grown. Uh, last year, 35% of our services were over 400. Can you say amen? That is wonderful to see uh, that happening. One of the main reasons we could do that now is because we have two services. And here's our average attendance the last couple years uh, in first service. And once we created first service, it shifted uh, space for second service. Now what we're finding, as you can see here, is second service is now full again. How do we resolve that problem? Um, so we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. Uh, Pathfinder Club, let me talk about a few of our different ministries that are growing as well. Pathfinder Club went from 14 four years ago to 49 today. And um, I don't know if Chris Hansen is here, but I know Bill Legg is doing phenomenal work with our young people. They're learning things you just don't learn in any other setting. Um, it's great. Kids go to the school to do this, and they're excited. And they're just, they're just charged up. They're charged up like Heather Die, <laughs> who we're going to talk about here in a minute, too. She's like, what? You're going to talk about me? Um, active in ministry. This is one of the most important numbers in all of the numbers we look at because we want people in this church community to be engaged in a ministry that charges in their batteries, that energizes them, that gets them excited. And so we spread out the work into, so that everybody can be involved based on their gifts, their passions, from young to old. We want everyone involved. And so uh, we have 228 active members that are uh, participating in a ministry. And this doesn't even include, this does not include our volunteers that are not regular attendees. So that number is actually higher. But to see that go up almost 100 in the last four years is super exciting for us to see. Uh, one of the ministries that people can get involved with is the car ministry. And we will uh, have a great team. This is at John uh, Cardwell's house. Uh, they have a shop out back where they work on cars. Cars get donated. They, they give cars away. We gave away three cars last year. And we uh, repaired eight cars uh, for a total expense of 4950 bucks. Hallelujah. So that's really exciting to see. Let's give him a hand. Yeah, and John and his team, John, Jeff Shelton, Lyndon, there's a whole group of them, Angel, uh, working on cars, and uh, the reason why they can do it so inexpensively is they'll either buy a, a car really cheap or the, a car will get donated. So we gave away three cars. Uh, there on the right, Zanika got a car uh, last year, so this ministry is just thriving, and, and maybe someday we'll actually get that ministry on campus here, so... Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Amen Clinic was last year as well. 1,450 patients were served in that ministry. And to think about the impact, I have in parentheses Love Heals because that is the new name going forward with Amen Clinic. Uh, this church is heavily involved with Amen Clinic. We have a lot of the key directors on that. Uh, we have uh, the Cornforth, Fred Cornforth really spearheads this ministry locally and, uh, and not only here but in other cities. And Fred, I want to just thank you for what you're doing to reach out to the people in need in this community. Let's give Fred a hand. Yeah. And that clap was for Fred and his better half, Jill Cornforth. <laughs> yeah, good people right here. Um, so 400, you can see the services there, 371 needing glasses. Um, 
the dental, 765 services, 165 extractions. Doesn't that sound fun? 198 fillings for all you sugar daddies out there. Uh, 275 cleanings, 490 dental x-rays. Medical, there was 537 services provided. Uh, when 35, 34 labs, were, blood work was done. 860 volunteers for that three-day ministry. 860. Now, let's give them a hand. Many of you were part of that. And I'll tell you, when people come to, to an amen clinic, they see the love of Jesus. It is so tangible, so real. They are so blown away that somebody would do something like that for them for free. And uh, so we keep moving forward with that. Babylon uh, was the theme for VBS this year. And uh, Bob, you can see him on the bottom right hand. He was uh, Nebuchadnezzar for that. That was really cool. So you can see those numbers, just really healthy numbers as we continue to grow with Vacation Bible School. One of the top-notch uh, VBSs uh, to go to is one that Cloverdale does. Here's our campus at our Boise Valley school campus across the parking lot there. And here's our numbers. We're in a rebuilding phase. We really are trying to look at what we need to do to offer the best experience educationally, spiritually, emotionally for our young people. So we see this last year we had a, our open enrollment at 60. And we're expecting that number to continue to grow as we work, as we improve the facility, as we add staff. One of those uh, innovations has been our new website, and we've added a new school teacher whose uh, name is Heather Dye. And uh, we're going to, in fact, I'll show you. Um, I want Heather to see her picture right there. Our, our new music class. We're super excited about that and super excited for Heather's in, enrollment, involvement at the school. I want to back up for a second here. Uh, one of the things that we've figured out how to do is to market all of the schools in the valley with one uh, advertising package so that when we advertise, all the schools can benefit from it and not just one school. And that's, we created Adventist Advantage. It's a website. It also has a brochure, and it's a, it's a tagline that we can use for radio ads. So we have uh, received a donation and funding to do radio ads on KTSY five days a week for the next 365 days. That is exciting to hear our young people talking about the impact of the school on their lives, uh, whether it's Boise Valley or Eagle or Jim State, to hear parents talk about that. We're super excited about Adventist Advantage. One of the brochure, here's a trifold uh, of the brochure. It gives stats on the truth about Adventist education and how it's really impacting young people. Here's a stat in the brochure you may not know. U.S. graduate who complete college degrees, 80% of kids that go to Adventist schools complete their college degree as opposed to 14% uh, who go to public schools. So that's a pretty dramatic advantage if you want your kid to go uh, on to further education after graduation. And um, I want to introduce you to our new part-time principal. Uh, Mr. Utt is, is coming to us. Come on up. And he is, yeah, give him a hand. We, we knew in, in trying to create a part-time position for a principal at our school to relieve uh, teacher Lawson, Melanie Lawson, from the work she was doing there. I'm taking two roles. And uh, we knew would, we would need the right person and from the inception of wanting to do the principalship to funding to uh, Mr. Utt being here was about three months. It was just amazing. And we wanted to bring him up here to say a few words. And also, if you have a chance, he comes with 43 years of experience in the classroom and in teaching and in principalship. So we are very excited about his presence at, at the school. We wanted to introduce you to him today and have him say a few words. Um, also mention to us why you're here, because it's actually a miracle that you live in Boise. Well, about over a year ago, we came up Thanksgiving to just check Boise out because, you know, no one in their right mind wants to retire in Turlock, California. <laughs> and you just happened to arrange to have the mountains covered with snow. And <clears throat> my wife, who's sitting in the uh, one, two, three, fourth row there, doesn't want to be pointed out, <laughs> said, this is it. 
And we purchased, we moved here in June. <clears throat> Little did we know that you were doing this. Um, and then I get a call from my superintendent who hired me in Modesto back in 1990, Milton Thorman, and hey, Ken, we have a job for you. And I said, Milton, I'm retired. That's why we have a job for you. <laughs> we, of course, have been involved. My wife and I together have spent 83 years in the classroom. And last year she retired, I retired also, and she spent half her time at Central Valley Christian Academy, which I call Modesto Adventist Academy. And I understand Jill's with me on that one. Um, she taught half time. Well, I went back to my public school, high school, and, and did long term subbing. And the year before I retired, I told my high school kids that I had been involved in education for, I've been going to school for over 60 years. And some smart little appy in the back goes, well, you'd think you'd have graduated by now. <laughs> but we, wife and I, love kids. And we've been through church hopping through the Boise area. And, and this church in Caldwell are the ones that have kids. And so she's volunteering at Caldwell two days a week. And I was volunteering at Gem State Academy mowing lawns. And, you know, I didn't realize how much lawn they had. <laughs> you ever edged all the sidewalks? And then, of course, you look at this campus. You've got a lot of grass here, too. And so I'm excited about being in the school. It's a wonderful school. It's a beautiful school. And I like to thank Hoover burned down the old one. Because this is a beautiful physical plant. I mean, it's, it's like a, a Cadillac job. And uh, you have a wonderful staff, and of course, you just saw Game Night Heather. She is a music teacher to die for. Okay, I had to throw that in there. Anyway. <laughs> but you have a wonderful staff. And I have enjoyed sh showing up when I show up, because I'm only allowed 19 hours. And having kids stick their head in my, from the hallway to let me know that they're there and say, hi, Mr. Utt, and uh, walking through classrooms. I warned the teachers, I would be walking through their classrooms on a regular basis, two or three times a day probably in some cases. And it's just fun to see that energy and knowing that I don't have to deal with it in a classroom all day long. <laughs> and I can walk in and, and, and stir the kids up and walk away. <laughs> so it's really fun. And uh, I have a little girl here in the front row who had the nerve to hit me with a snowball. <laughs> and uh, she's ignoring me. It's just been fun to interact with kids. And my goal is to see the school grow. Because I believe the school is the best kept secret in this congregation, in this town. And if you have a kid or a grandkid that you are interested in bringing them over to Boise Valley Adventist School, call the school, get a hold of me, buttonhole me in the, in the lobby. I will come visit you at your home to talk about the school and your needs and if we can make it a, a workable thing because that is a, an amazing place. And I am really thankful that you put something in motion before I got here. And I've been wondering, why did we move to Boise besides, besides the, you know, the beautiful scenery? Maybe there was another plan in mind. Hey, man, give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Up. Absolutely. God works in the wonderful and mysterious ways. We're going to go through some numbers here. Uh, the first is tithe, looking at the tithe trend over the last six years. And uh, really healthy numbers. Our net change has been $172,000 in six years. We had a, in 2017, we had a, a, a huge uptick that we couldn't quite explain. And we're sure, not sure how to explain it even now other than maybe a few people had like a major inheritance or a, a substantial property they sold. But we went up $105,000 in 2017, 
and then it dropped back down to what seemed more normal for us to 759. So it dropped down $76,000. Actually, that number is off a little bit. It's like 763 is what our total tithe is this year after we looked at last numbers. But um, we're really looking at, a, and, and as far as a general trend, real healthy giving. I want to share with you that uh, it, our God is, is, owns everything. Would you agree in the universe? So resources for God's no problem, right? If you're infinite in power, you have no problem uh, creating resources. And uh, we cannot outgive God. And so I just want to encourage you to be faithful in your tithing. And the next numbers are for local budget is, I think, are going to be exciting for us as well. Uh, when we look at the growth of this church in, in every area, one of the challenges we're faced again with is this, the size of the sanctuary and the limitation to seating. So last year we created a vision committee that anybody could go to. Didn't matter who you were, you could come to the vision committee. We met for about three or four months, and at the end of that, we came up with four priorities that we submitted to the church board to review. Uh, priority of number one was the sanctuary flooring, seating, and stage, and getting this uh, uh, up to speed and creating a, a, f a higher seating capacity, about probably 100 seats in here just by changing some of the flow of, of the sanctuary. Phase two is a multi-purpose building, 22,000 square feet that you would walk out these doors here to through a, a short breezeway into. And this building could be used for a lot of the... Re we could build it with the, the car stalls in it if we wanted to. We, we need a fellowship hall that fits all of us Anytime you eat fellowship meal, which you're welcome to stay today, it's the first and third Sabbaths we have them. It's always full in there. Um, we also would love to have a, a kitchen that's a cooking kitchen, uh, some multi-purpose rooms. I would love to see this church offer a clothing ministry that was just offered four times a year for uh, kids. Because as a parent, your kids grow so fast that it's hard financially to be able to keep up with the cost on that. Wouldn't that be nice if we had four times a year a clothing uh, ministry where people could come in and get free clothes for their kids and exchange it for their clothes? Um, so there's a lot of things we could dream and vision about with this multi-purpose facility. But that was priority two. Priority three was then after that's built, we can eat there and we can take the fellowship hall and, and renovate it so we have more Sabbath school classes because all our Sabbath school space is full throughout the whole building. If you, any new Sabbath school always gets started in the school now. Um, and then we looked at the sanctuary and the balcony. This was engineered for a balcony. And I, there's, some, there's a member of the church here that said back in the 90s, they were so excited as a kid because this church was going to have a balcony. That was in the 90s. There is no balcony. It's still, it's, and so... What happens, I want to explain a little bit about church governance f with you for just a moment. I won't be long on this. Where is the authority of the church at Cloverdale? Is it in me? No. Can I decide that I want to renovate the sanctuary? And then we do it. Can I decide I want to start a, a new Sabbath school? And just do it. You guys are... <laughs> All right, I'll change that. All right, anyway, here's my point. I work, I'm a member of the board who makes the decisions of the day-to-day -day operations of this church. But when we want to do big things, the authority of the church is in business session, which every member has a voice and a vote at, and it's at business sessions where we make major decisions collectively as a body. That's how we are governorly structured as a church. And so when they got together at the business session with these recommendations from the board that got them from the vision committee, I was not at the meeting. Me and Pastor Steve were at a class in Washington State. Um, while we were there, well, it was NPUC. Um, while we were there, the, you as a church body were meeting here, and as you were discussing this list of priorities, what started to become a theme is, why isn't the balcony part of phase one? And through that conversation, 
the church body in business session said, let's combine phase one and phase four so that we can do it all together at once and move forward with the project that way. And so that's why phase one now is not just the lower level. Phase one is actually the upper level and it doubles the capacity of this church in seating. And so that is super, super exciting. It's going to take some money to do this. We've started to fundraise for it. Um, we launched our fundraiser officially November 10, so less than two months ago. And we had this incredible uh, thermometer to gauge it. So the last time we filled this, I'm going to bring this over here, was a couple weeks ago. We updated this so you could tell how much we needed still to raise in order to get to this one point. $2 million mark. And so, Jareen, we're going to have you come up. We haven't uh, been able to update it for a couple weeks, so just go ahead and each one of these seats represents $1,500. So how did we do in the last couple weeks? So go ahead and fill it in. Okay, get the big one then. Yeah. All right. Good, good. I like it. So do it for us. How are we doing? All right. Oh. Yeah, let's do it. I'm not paying for this, of course. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. Back it up. I'm not donating that much money. No. Wish I had it. Wow. Nice. So, our total to date is $363,000 that we've raised in the last two months. Let me see some enthusiasm. So, I, I would love to see us start this project this summer. Um, it's a great time of year to do it because we have people that are gone. Um, less attend attendance drops down somewhat. Um, I don't know. God is a big God. Do you think we could get it started by this summer? Get the balcony, get the, the staircases going up, get the family room over in that back corner uh, where people come in and families, they can, with young families, they can stay in there, be able to see the service and not be back in a far room. Um, I think we can do it. I really do. Here's our combined budget numbers. We were a little concerned as we raised funds for the new building project that we might be hurting in our local budget. Our local budget funds everything we do uh, ministry-wise on a local level. Even our uh, associate pastors are all paid through our local budget. They're local hires. And I got the best pastoral staff in the world. And you guys are blessed to have the three pastors that we have at this church uh, with Jason and with Steve and with Jennifer. Uh, let's give them a hand. Yes. So last year, we went over, we collected more than our, our combined budget need. Uh, in 2017, I think our combined budget was around 206, or do you remember the number, Tony? 20, something like that? 210. Um, so we, got, we raised 216, which is great. Uh, every year, we go with more needs, more budget requests, and finance committee, as they see that, that increased pattern, it gives them more confidence that we can raise it. This year, our local budget uh, was 200 and, I mean, 220,000, which was the highest budget we've had in a long time. And um, ever, yeah, 220 was the highest budget we've ever had. And so if you come back next week, I'll show you what that number is. So let's close with prayer. No, just kidding. All right. Um, the number that came in. $244,000. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That was a net increase of $21,000 over budget um, and over uh, the, the, the net change in, in five years is we doubled our combined budget giving. $122,000 was the net change in those five years. So it is great to see uh, your generosity and how God is leading us as a church Transfers out for Cloverdale. We had 22 people that transferred out this year. Uh, 
16 went out of state, they moved away, and we had six that went to other local churches in the area. We have also our transfers in. Here's our numbers. Since 2014, we started to see a, a, a major uptick in that. Uh, beginning in 2016, we've averaged a transfer a week uh, for three years. And so that is, these are some incredible families. Where are they all coming from? Well, this year's 55, 38 from out of state, and 17 from area churches. So that's where that 55 number comes from today that we see up there. We also uh, count our baptisms, all the precious souls that are joining our church through baptism. You can see the trend there. We started out with four to six, then 11, then the 19. We had another great year this year, 17. I would like to suggest that God, in his work among us, that it would not be too ambitious to, to say that we could average a baptism a Sabbath in this church. We already are a third of the way there. I think we can get to a place in the next few years where we average a baptism a Sabbath. 52 people in a given year that join this church. What do you think? you think it's possible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some great people. Professions of faith is a way to join the church if you've already been baptized. And so those numbers are really good this year. Six uh, people did professions of faith. So our overall growth with the 55 transfers, the 17 baptisms, the six professions of faith, we had 78 people come in. If you um, take out the 22 transfers, we had a, a net growth of 56 amazing people in one year. That's a whole church in a lot of areas. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. New ministries. We have the adult choir with Bill Chun study. Can I hear an amen there? Yes. The Solace House uh, is a new ministry. It's not a ministry that we actually direct, but it's an in, a ministry we want to give financial support towards as a church. So the board has, has heard the proposal, wants to fund. You'll hear more about that in, in this coming year because part of it we want to give through local budget and part of it we want to fundraise. The Solace House is a safe house for uh, girls that have been uh, saved from human trafficking here in Idaho. And it's, it's a sad world we live in when we need these kinds of ministries, but we do, and who will help them if we don't? And so the Solace House, it, will, it's, it can uh, house five to ten girls at a time and help them to start a new life. And so we're excited about that. You'll hear more about that as we go through. But that's a new ministry that we're excited to partner with this coming year. We have a once-a-quarter fellowship meal for families that just started with young children. So parents that have young kids, this is a, a fellowship meal to get to know each other. And uh, we're excited about that this year. We've got lots of, of, of activity with the young adults as far as we got a, a young adult Sabbath school. We didn't have one of those before. Uh, we have a young adult dinner social so they can get to know each other better and connect. And uh, our third uh, leg of this ministry is really uh, being able to provide leadership development for, for them and service opportunities, get involved in service ministries out in the community as a group, as a, as a family. We want to be known as a church that invests in the people here. We want to be known as a church that mentors the people that are here. We, we want to be known as a church that cares and develops the leadership skills. We all need to be better dads, to be better sons and daughters, to be better co-workers or bosses or church members. We want to invest in that process so that we're all growing, that we're becoming more effective, that we're becoming more engaging and energized so that when we're walking down the streets of gold, it's not a bunch of strangers. So we're looking forward to seeing how that moves forward. Celebrating Life and Recovery relaunch this year. Great ministry to help us with our brokenness. You know, for too many years, this church has pretended like we all have it together. That's a pretty ridiculous thought, isn't it? We don't. We need to work through issues, and this is a great ministry to do that. Sparks Kids Quarterly Worship was new last year. It just started at the front of last year. Excited about that. Some neat things coming up 
uh, this, this year as well with Spark. Adventures and Odyssey is coming here. Did you know that? Yeah. We're going to have a live broadcast of Adventures and Odyssey. They're going to do a program here. So keep your eye out for that. Um, hey, Pastor Troy, are you going to start the new year off without reminding them to read their Bibles? At least a chapter a day, five out of seven days. Who put that in there? <laughs> I want to talk about this for a minute. We are in such a confused world because the world is trying to figure out answers from a human population that's carnal by nature. So there's tons of confusion. There's tons of distractions. There's tons of misinformation. Who knows what to believe anymore? How do we get directed in the right path? Now, I want to share something with you I'm going to preach about here in a while. Uh, How is it that the Holy Spirit is going to get you to think the right way without violating your freedom of thought? How is the Holy Spirit going to get you to behave the right way without violating your freedom of choice? Well, one of the main ways God does that is as we read the Bible, because as we read the Bible, we start to learn how God thinks, what he wants for our life, what he is wanting to give us for our life. But if we neglect the Bible and it's just collecting dust in our house, how is the Holy Spirit going to help us to change and grow and mature and heal? What is going to happen if that's that's neglected? So 2019 is not the year to keep the Bible on the shelf and the newspaper or People magazine or the TV on and all the while when God's Spirit is trying to teach us to think differently, to think healthy, and it's sitting on a desk somewhere and we don't care less about it because it doesn't engage us. We've got to get to be a place where we study the Bible on a regular basis all the time. It is the power of God to change this world. All of us are here today because of the Bible. Would you agree? None of us would be here without the Bible. We'd be worshiping God some other way. But he's built a community and he's built it through the study of his word. So please don't neglect that. Don't let that Bible set. May it be your best friend. May it be the one item in your house that you can't live without. Our planning session tomorrow is at 9 for any leader that schedules events. We are becoming more and more active, so we need more and more involvement with the leaders in scheduling at one time so we can get the calendar put together. Years ago, one of the ministries we started, two years now, this is the second year, was Prayer Connect. We knew the weekly prayer meeting would only attract a certain amount of people, but we knew we had to get as many people in the church praying as possible. And so Prayer Connect was a ministry to where you would just talk to somebody by phone once a week and pray together. And so I wanted to ask Bill Legg to come up and just share with us briefly what Prayer Connect has done for him in his own personal life. So Bill, how did you, who's your prayer partner and how did you get connected with, with them? Well, ben, ben Chan and I are prayer, uh, prayer uh, partners. And uh, last year... There was an appeal here in the church that um, we should do this. And um, I threw my name in the barrel. And uh, within, I don't know, three or four days, maybe a week, um, Josh got a hold of me by email and said, hey, I have Ben Chan that is willing to connect or wants to connect. And I said, sure, let's do it. So that's how we got connected. Amen. So, Bill, tell us a little bit. How has that impacted your life? How is this time of prayer on the phone once a week with Ben. How has that affected your life? Well, Ben and I have chosen to connect twice a week. And um, it's very interesting how close you can draw to someone when you do this. I mean, it's incredible what it does to you. Ben and I have, have drawn so close now that we're almost like family. I mean, we have our highs, we have our lows. And the prayer connect, being able to share like this one-on-one um, it allows us to really, really um, appreciate what the Lord can do and what the Lord has done through prayer. 
And um, Ben is, a, is a, just an awesome, awesome man, awesome person, tremendous Christian. And I would venture to say that anybody else in here that has joined the Prayer Connect, you would say the same thing about your partner. It's just wonderful what it does to, to be one-on-one -on -one like this. And another thing that Ben has volunteered, and I jumped right in on it because I love it. He said, hey, Bill, why don't we try listing five things in the evening that we're thankful for before we go to bed? at night. And I said, okay, let's do that. So we've been doing that for several months now. And that allows us to get some good rest when we go to bed. It's really, really cool. And I really, one quick thing that I would really like to share with you, if any of you have served in the military, you know what it means to look out for the, for the fellow soldier, for the person next to you. I feel this way now about Ben Chan. Mm. I mean, I'm not going to let him down. I'm not going to let him hurt. I'm going to work with him. I'm going to share with him. I'm going to help him because he's going to help me. Praise the Lord. Join Prayer Connect. Amen. Amen. So, Bill, one last question. Okay. How are you doing on your five out of seven days a week? Well, um, this Prayer Connect has really... It's just incredible. It's made me stop and think. And I... When, when Pastor Troy mentions in the past, I said, yeah, okay, okay, a chapter a day, yeah, okay, okay. Well, since I've been connecting with Ben, this is a reminder. Bill Legg, you better not start your day without a chapter. And so every day now, it's just become a, a, an automatic thing. I can't go in the day without my chapter. Mm. And I walk every morning for three or four miles, and I jump up, and I have my prayer, do my, do my chapter, and maybe I'm in. I mean, it's a great day from that point on. This really helped me a lot. Prayer Connect will do it for you. I'm telling you, you got to join. Amen. Excellent. Give him a hand, Bill Leg. He's also our Pathfinder director, doing a fantastic job. Let me bring this to a close. I want to go back to the one question. Why are we growing? What is, I don't believe in silver bullets. I don't think if you do just this one thing, you're going to grow as a church. But I don't see how we could grow without doing this one thing. Uh, you look at, the, if, if we were to plant a garden, you don't just, all right, throw some, throw some seeds or plants in, in the garden and just leave it, right? You can't do that. You've got to put time into it. You've got to be able to, to till and, and, and do rows and, and space them out apart so that everything is in order. And it's not just in gardening. It's in budget. It's in your own personal life. How do you, you you're, even the trillions of cells in your body right now are all orchestrated by God's design. And so when we think about God, his mind is always in order. It's always working by design and by principle and by and unity. And so when I read this next quote out of a book called Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, when I read this quote, it changed how I pastor. And when you come next week, I'll tell you what it is. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So, oh, by the way, Unsealed is coming up next week. Please, please pray for this ministry Bring a friend if you can. Bring yourself. It's a great season of life. We're doing it live here. It's being broadcast to five other locations in the valley. So here's the quote. Angels work harmoniously. Perfect order characterizes all their movements. The more closely we imitate the harmony and order of the angelic host, the more successful will be the efforts of these heavenly agents in our behalf. If we see no necessity for harmonious action and are disorderly, undisciplined, and disorganized in our course of action, angels who are thoroughly organized and move in perfect order cannot work for us successfully. They turn away in grief for they are not authorized to bless confusion, distraction, and disorganization. Now you can think about this in many different ways, but how are we being organized to be missional in what we're doing and, and giving Bible? For example, if someone came to the door and said, hey, I want Bible studies. You know, four years ago, I'd be like, oh, great. And in my mind, I'd be like, okay, now who can give, who can, who would I think could match with them that might be able to give a Bible study? You know, how is it possible to have a church that doesn't have a Bible school when we all join the church through Bible study? 
So we built a Bible school so when people have interest, we can connect them to people that have been trained to give Bible studies. Just one scenario, but we need to be trained and organized. That's what we've done with member placement. That's what we've done with, with welcoming our new members in. It's what we've done with, with planning out, whether it's the budget or uh, going through our, our calendar for the year. We want to be organized. So second paragraph, all who desire the cooperation of the heavenly messengers must work in unison with them. Those who have the unction from on high will in all their efforts encourage order, discipline, and union of action, and then the angels of God can cooperate with them. But never, never will these heavenly messengers place their endorsement upon irregularity, disorganization, and disorder. disorder. All these evils are the result of Satan's efforts to weaken our forces, to destroy courage, and to prevent successful action. So we want to be very organized in the way we function as a church so that like Elisha, we can say, look at the hills. Look who's working for us. You know, when Jesus, let me say this in closing, and we'll do the song. When Jesus came out of, the, out of his tomb, you think about this for a minute. He, and by the way, Dwayne, can we bring that barrel up here? This is... I want this barrel up here. If you want to join Prayer Connect, put your name and email on, on a slip of paper and drop it in here, and we will contact you to see, one, if you have someone you already want to pray with or you want us to pick someone else for you of the same gender. So this is here. Tear off your bulletin. Tear off a piece of paper. Put your name, email on it, and we will get in contact with you. More prayer, more power. We want this church to be a praying church at all times. And so when, when Jesus, wrote, when he rose up off of the, the slab of rock or whatever he was on, he just went through a miserable death. He had just been through the torture of dying on a cross, bearing the sins of the whole world. He opened up the access for all of us to be saved when he died on the cross. And now he's rising up from the grave. He's got all of heaven waiting for him. And he's, as he's getting ready and the angels rolled back the stone and Jesus is now ready to engage in a, in a future where Satan has been completely defeated, we can be saved, and he has all these things to do. Do you know what Jesus decides to do? He decides to take the burial cloth and fold it up in an orderly way and put it by his deathbed and walk out. Why? Because God is a God of perfect order. And the more we seek God's order in our church life and his love in our church body, we can't even begin to imagine what he's going to do here at Cloverdale. There is no limit to what we're going to see God do. I want to be part of a church where we can say God is at, on the move. And we're seeing that, and it's because of you. And the more we work together in an organized fashion, seeking God, seeking to be servants to his cause, the greater the future of Cloverdale is. Let's close with a song, Bringing in the Sheaves. And again, at the end of the closing song, whenever, just drop your name in the bucket. A new friend is waiting for you in this process as well. We're going to sing an old song. How many remember bringing in the sheaves? Yeah, what? Bringing in the sheaves. We probably will never sing this again as a church congregation. So sing it well. We're here to minister. That's what the song is about. Let us all stand. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, what an honor it is to be servants In this world, we all long for that day, I believe. We'll sit on the grass and look at each other and say, ah, it's done. We're home. May we work to share that future with the rest of this community. Thank you for this day. Lord, you've blessed us way beyond what we could have expected. Thank you. May you lead us as a church as we move forward. May your angels love to dwell at Cloverdale. Bless us and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.